I still have quite a bit of knowledge and I take zero credit for that because I know that came from my parents uh, instilling in me a love for God's Word and encouraging me to have a Bible. I still remember the very first Bible I got of my own when I was 10 years old. Before that, they let me have an, an old Bible to use. But because they disciplined me and trained me to carry a Bible from a young age, I may have been six or so when I started to bring my own Bible to, to, to the church meetings. And, and by, just by that, I think the best word I can think of is osmosis. There's a word in biology called osmosis where if you're around something, if you're in, you know, think of an organism that's in water, by osmosis the water can come into it. And I think that's what happened. Just by, by, by having a Bible and listening to God's Word, having verses in the home, learning Sunday school verses, it, I remember that to this day. I remember things in God's Word and I know I never, I don't remember ever actually consciously sitting down and studying that passage, let's say, or that story, but it's there. So I share that that's something I'm trying to take to heart for my own children as well, to discipline them from as early as they can read, to bring their own Bible and, uh, and use it, turn to every verse. Uh, it's, it's, it'll benefit us all in the long run, I really believe it. Um, instead of wandering around or being, being distracted, whenever a verse is referenced, that's something we were taught uh, as kids. If, a verse is, if the preacher says a verse, turn to it. Don't sit there and wait for him to read it. Turn to it, look at it yourself. I think it will really help us. So I hope we as adults can also take that to heart. Um, in the book of Ezra, we're going to look at um, the work of building the temple. And essentially what I'd like us to see here briefly um, is some lessons that we can learn from this story and how God led Ezra and the other people to rebuild the temple. Uh, some valuable lessons. I think I picked out a few. I'm sure you may be able to find more. There are probably more than that. And on Wednesday... We were so taken up with the first one that that's all we spend time on. Uh, so that first one, uh, I would word it this way, from chapter 1, verse 1. We saw that God moves supernaturally to fulfill His Word. And so we only need to be dependent on Him, not on man. We saw how God moved Cyrus. And we compared the way of building Zion, the way of building Jerusalem, the way of building God's temple with how the world does it with Babylon. We read Revelation 17 and 18 together and how Babylon is the contrast of Zion, of Jerusalem. And the difference essentially between Babylon and Jerusalem is this. Babylon, you know, the root of it is from Babel, the Tower of Babel. And that signifies the work of man, even the work of man to try to reach up to God. You know, they said, we're, we're going to reach up into the heavens. But it was the work of man. God wasn't behind it. And we can do what we think is the work of God, evangelism, Bible studies, prayer meetings, church gatherings, all of these things, even fellowship. We can even plant and build churches, but it can be our work. And one day God will destroy it. He'll bring confusion. It will be Babel. He'll break it all apart and it'll disperse. But if it's the work of God, the eternal city, it will last forever. And we want to commit ourselves to, being, to doing only God's work, not our ideas. So, from the first lesson we learned there is that you can write it there if you'd like. God moves supernaturally to fulfill His Word. It says, it, to fulfill, read that first verse, to fulfill the Word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah. God had already prophesied through Jeremiah and He moved the heart of an ungodly king like Cyrus to fulfill His Word. And God can do that. So the only um, connection, you know how the world talks about having connections. You have connections. If you have connections, you can succeed in life. The only connection you need to have if you want to build, do God's work is connection with God. Okay, let's look at the second one. And, um, in, I'd like somebody to read, I won't pass the mic around, but if just, just read it out loud. Chapter 2, verses 68 and 69. Somebody who has it first, just read it out loud. Chapter 2, verses 68 and 69. Okay, what lesson can we learn from this about how God is looking to build His temple to do His work? Yeah, He wants the people to be involved, to be part of it. And specifically how? 
willingly by sacrificing by sacrificing what yeah money I mean let's not be afraid to say it um, that's what they gave it was gold and silver and priestly garments and if you've been listening to the messages Phil has been preaching in the last three times you've seen that God is very practical now God doesn't need money he doesn't need it he's not dependent on it but he chooses to use it and he knows that the enemy of God is mammon and so where he wants to see that we're willing to sacrifice is, will you give your money? I mean, it doesn't get more practical than that. And I think it's a deception to think that I'll come and give my time and be an attendee, and, but I'm just going to hold my money to myself and think that God can use me to build his work. If, it, if, if building the church hasn't cost you something financially, I ask you to look, go back and look and ask, ask the Lord to test your heart. Now, this is, not, this is not about based on anything I'm seeing or hearing. It's just... I look at God's word and I say, God, you asked me to give my money. So that's why we teach and encourage you all. Now, the world takes it to an extreme where they make false promises based on money and the preachers collect the money themselves. As you know, there's not a single person in this church that receives any of the money that's given. It goes all of it to doing the work of God through evangelism, through ministries that the church is involved in, through building the, the body of Christ. So there's, there's an extreme but just because of the extreme, let's not be afraid of the truth. And the truth of God's word is that God loves a cheerful giver. And the context in which Paul says that, well, first of all, is financially, but you read in 1 Corinthians 16 and 2 Corinthians 9, he's talking specifically of us sacrificially giving of our money. And I believe with all of my heart that if I withhold giving to God financially, God will withhold to, from me blessing in my life. Any other thoughts on that? So I would, I would word it this way. The temple is built by the cheerful gift. See, it said they gave willingly. Now, it, it, it was also that phrase, um, uh, I think when Nick read it, it read according to their merit. And that, that's true. And it, mine reads according to their ability. That's the same thing essentially. According to your ability. So God is not saying, hey, you look at, you know, remember when Jesus was in the temple and he saw the Pharisees pouring out money and making a big show of it. And then a little widow gave and gave two mites. Let me ask you this question. You know the story, right? The Pharisees poured out out of their riches and the widow gave two mites. Who really gave according to their ability? Who do you think? The widow. So it's not quantity. It's according to your ability. So if all you have to give is two mites and you give cheerfully, that's according to your merit. And so God is not looking at how much, He's not counting the pennies and the dollars in the offering box. He's seeing the heart. He knows how much is in your bank account. He knows the spirit in which you gave. And you can give less than somebody else, but give according to your ability and cheerfully. And God says, I'm pleased with you. That's what God is looking for. Any thoughts on that? Okay, we'll move on. And if, you, if we need to come back, we've got a few of these. If we don't get through all of them, it's fine. But somebody else can read chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. So what do you see there about how God is looking to do His work, to build His church? Yeah, willing hearts. And how, how does He want us to, to do the work? Based on what? What's that? His word, yeah. It says there towards the end of verse 2, As it is written in the law, as it is written in the law of Moses. Now for them, it was the law of Moses. For us, it is the word of God inspired by the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit's working in our lives. So if we come up with this cute idea of how we should do it, imagine if the Israelites had thought, you know what, our fathers did it wrong, they messed up, and let's do it this other way. They had been 70 years in Babylon, and I'm sure they came up with wonderful ideas about how they could build a temple and how they could build an altar and how they could do it right. And if they had brought those Babylonian ideas into Jerusalem, God would have had nothing to do with it. That was what got them in the problem, in, into trouble in the first place. They incorporated the ideas of all these other nations around them and thought, we'll still worship God that way. And God says, no, as it is written in the law of Moses. 
and you see how God has written clearly in His Word what it means to build a church today. What is it that He is looking for? What is the pleasing and acceptable service of worship to Him? That's what He's looking for. You give Him something else and He's saying, I don't want that. I want your body. Romans 12, 1 and 2. What else do you see there? Hmm. So I see this faithful consistency in their sacrifice, in their offering to the Lord. And I think it's so easy in, you know, our human flesh to you know, really even be convicted or get a good idea and put this in our heart and do it for a while and then slack off. Hmm. And do it for a while and then slack off. But what they did here was they, they were consistent hmm. every day and regularly. It became a habit in their life. Yeah, consistency. I, I like that. You know, I think sometimes God looks for that. I, I really like that's that sitting with me and I'm meditating on it even now. Sometimes God looks for, you know how when, when we give, you know, that principle of even, let's say giving, uh, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Sometimes we give and expect an immediate return. Sometimes we, we, we deny ourselves, we take up our cross and say, okay, Lord, now you've got to give me this in return. But God says, no, I'm looking for consistency. Will you take up your cross for a year? before I show you the fulfillment of that promise or before I show you an answer to that prayer. How long are you willing to do it? Consistency. Every day, Jesus said. Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, don't come and be a martyr and die for me at the end of your life. Take up your cross every day. And tomorrow you get up and you do the same thing. And the day after that, you get up and do the same thing. And day by day, you take up your cross. And it might seem like nothing's coming out of this going into the ground and dying. But you, because of faith in God, you know you will bear fruit. We have His Word as our assurance. Our faith is based on the Word of Christ. Any other thoughts? What do you see in verse 3? Uh, right there in the middle, or the first part of verse 3. Why did they do it? Why do you see that they built an altar? It seems to be a very mundane reason. A very honest reason, though. Terrified. They were terrified. Yeah. I mean, they were afraid of the people. I mean, they knew that they, they saw God working miraculously, but they came here and they were terrified of the people around them. It says, man, this is the scary stuff around me. Let's build an altar. That's a wonderful word of comfort and promise for us. Are you in the midst of terror? Are you in the midst of anxiety? Are you in a situation where you're oppressed? where you're afraid of what might happen. Maybe it's a sickness. Maybe it's a financial situation. Maybe it's a relationship issue. If there's terror around you, fear God. You know that, that verse in Isaiah 8, I think it's verse 13, the Living Bible paraphrases this way. If you fear God, you need fear nothing else. That was a verse they used to have in the church building in CFC, and I'll never forget it. It's there in my head. I know the reference because it was there. And often I've thought about this. Lord, if I fear you, there is nothing on this earth I need to fear. No circumstance that's awaiting for me down the road. No financial difficulty. No sickness. No nothing. I'm, I may not necessarily get that financial situation solved the way I want it. I may not get healing from that sickness the way I want it. But I don't have to fear it My fear, if I fear God. So they demonstrated their fear of God by building Him an altar. says, we're going to honor God. We're not going to worry about the terrifying around us. Any thoughts on that? Take it as an important principle. They were led, you know, they were shown favor by King, by Cyrus. Yeah. And it wasn't an easy road after that. Right. It says here that they, like you say, were surrounded by things that terrified them, even though they knew that God was helping them. Hmm. Yeah, and as you were saying that, that uh, reinforced what we saw in the first point. Their confidence was not in Cyrus. When they saw the terror around them, they didn't think, oh, well, well let's go get Cyrus to bring us some soldiers. Their confidence was not. I think that one of the lessons that God had taught the people of Israel through their captivity was, let your confidence not be in man. So they didn't go running to Cyrus saying, hey, there are terrified people or terrifying people around us. Give us some soldiers to protect us. They said, let's build an altar to God. We'll fear Him. 
Okay, somebody read verse 9 of chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse 9. What do you see there? What's, the, what's a principle that we can learn from that and how God wants to do His work? They had a lot of support. They had everybody put their heart into the work. Yeah, they had a lot of support. So there was a bunch of people. But what was characteristic about this group of people? Families. What did you say, Matt? Families. families, yes, there were families, I agree. And what Ed said, they were unified. My Bible reads, the Joshua with his sons and brothers stood united with. So these were a bunch of different families, and I think a beautiful picture of the church, how God is calling these different families, but He's saying, in order for me to do something through you, stand united with them. As I, I picture them, arm in arm, linked to says, hey, we're together. If there was disunity with them, within them, and infighting, and uh, bitterness, and backbiting, and all this slander and stuff, and they're fighting with each other, nothing could have ever happened. These different families, the, the sons and brothers and all these different families stood united with each other. God called these different families, many of them, like you said, John, and then the work of God could begin. So I see a principle there that in order for God to begin His work, whether it's a home, what is God looking for in order to establish a home, establish His presence in your home? Unity, husbands and wives. That's why unity is the foundational principle in our marriages, unity. In the church, same thing, unity. If there's unity, it can start. There, it can begin. Like you know, if there's unity, if a man and a woman come together in unity, a home can begin. If two men and two families, as a, as a beginning, can come together, God can build His church. So they were united together. So God begins His work by first establishing unity among His workers. Not, hey, let me send them off to, to seminary or let them, let them go get these gifts and do this and do that. No, it's unity. And however long it takes for that unity to be established, God will wait until it is there, and then He can do something. I mean, the gifts, God is not limited by any lack of resource. God can manufacture resource by the word of His mouth. What He lacks is unity. What he find, I think as He looks around this earth, what it's hard for Him to find is two willing to become one. Okay, somebody read verse 11. So we see that they were united, they laid the foundation, and then what did they do? What did, they gave thanks, they praised. What is the principle you see there? What's a lesson we can learn in doing God's work? I think when we see God do work, we need to attribute His work to people mm. rather than to look past the people. Mm. Mm. Yeah. They gave thanks to him. Yeah. Very good. That's, I like what you said, Josh. Think about it. You know, often if you hear a wonderful message, you, you're likely to go and thank the preacher who said it. says, man, I thank you for that message you preached. Now, it's okay to do that. It says, let them that labor in the Word be worthy of double honor. But did you remember to stop and thank God who spoke to you through it? Did you stop and give Him praise for that wonderful time of fellowship we, we had one day? Do you go back from a Sunday morning and say, thank you, Lord. Yeah, yeah, God uses us as, as His people. But do you go back and say, Lord, I'm so grateful that you spoke to me today. You didn't have to. There are people out in the world that go through life never hearing the Word of God. It's His mercy. So I see a principle here that every step along the way, God is looking for us to thank Him and praise Him because His loving kindness is upon Israel forever. His loving kindness is upon us forever. Today that I woke up and I, I wake up thinking, Lord, your mercies are new this morning. Thank you. And go back... Another, another, another thing happens, thank you. What caused one of the lepers to get salvation was this. He came back and said, thank you, Lord. The others got healing and they got some blessing in their life. But do you want salvation? Do you want the complete work of God in your life? Do we want the complete work of God in our lives? Let's be a grateful, praising people. It's good to praise God. I noticed too that they were praising just because the foundation was there. Mm. The building wasn't even yeah. there. Isn't that interesting? That produced the to me when yeah. you said, When it's over. Yeah. But to be thankful every day as I work 
towards the goal, yeah. that I got a little closer to that goal. Yeah. That's what they did here. They, they had only just laid the foundation. Yeah. Good reminder. Think about this. You know, here we are being transformed day by day from glory to glory into His image. And if that's happening in your life, my dear brother, dear sister, if you are being transformed every day, you ought to praise God. Says, Lord, I believe it. I know I may have had mistakes, but I believe that I'm committed to your work and one more day has gone by and you are transforming me into the image of Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. It might look ugly yet. The house is not finished, like Phil said. Just the foundation, but it's one more step. Good to praise God every step along the way. Okay, somebody read verses 12 and 13. Yeah. No, it's good. Somebody read verses 12. Did we, no, we did that. Yeah, 12 and 13. But many of the priests and Levites and the heads of fathers' houses, old men, who had seen the first temple, wept with a loud voice when the foundation of this temple was laid before their eyes. Yet many shouted aloud for joy. So that the people could not discern the noise <coughs> of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people. For the people shouted with a loud shout, and the sound was heard afar off. What, why do you think the people were weeping? It says some of the old men especially. Why do you think they were weeping? The promise of God being fulfilled, yeah. What is it, and, and continuing on that thought, what is it about seeing the promise of God that brings forth weeping in us? Joy, yeah. And answer to prayer. And the word that's coming to my mind is burden. I think these old men had a burden in their heart. Lord, will you take us back to your people? How can we sing the songs like the psalm says, 137, I think. How can we sing the songs of Zion in, in, in Babylon? Take us back, Lord. And this older generation had said, Lord, take us back, take us back. And here they were seeing the beginning of the fulfillment or the fulfillment of that promise, and they wept. I think we will find a weeping come out of us when we carry a burden. And maybe it's a long time. Maybe it's 70, 80 years that you carry a burden. I'll tell you honestly, my brothers, and I don't want to say more, make this bigger than, than it is, but it is big in my eyes, I'll tell you this. When the Lord brought me here and established me in this church here, I wept and I still weep often when I think about it because it was a burden that I carried for years, that I would have a church family, that I would be integrated into Christ's body in a living way. And when I think about it often and I think about how I went for years without it, I weep. I says, Lord, why did you allow me to find this? I mean, we're not perfect. We make mistakes. We, 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 different things happen and there's day-to-day -day walking through life, but I weep over it. Like a man maybe who's been single for years or a woman's been single for years and one day God brings her and him to marriage. You know she's going to weep. You know he's going to weep. Because we thought it would never happen. I thought it was too late for me to experience it. And the Lord said, no, I'll, I'll give it to you. When you carry that burden, and there'll be different burdens, my dear friends, that dear brothers and sisters, that God will lay in your heart, carry it, nurture it. Let it grow like a woman growing, uh, carrying a baby. Imagine that a woman who carried a baby that she almost lost. She thought maybe it's going to be a miscarriage. But one day that baby comes alive. Can you imagine? You know she's going to cry. I thought I lost this baby and here he is. Here she is. That's how God wants to, us to carry the church. A burden for his kingdom, for the body of Christ in a living way. Let's carry it. Let's nurture it. Let's do everything within our ability to build up the church. And God will fulfill his promise. I have to think also at times that the older ones now they were rejoicing. Hmm. But it also has been possibly that they see the next generation. Hmm. They have a desire for the Lord and yeah. they are going on. Yeah. A little bit like I thought about this morning with Kimberly and Tristan here. They wanted to sing yeah. the songs this morning. Yeah. What a blessing for yeah. my heart. Yeah. And these older men, you know, I'm sure they had grandchildren there possibly, yeah. whatever. Yeah. They've seen the next generation. They're going on. Yeah. That's, That's a good point, John. And I, I think it indicated that the promise of God was not finished. And perhaps the people of Israel thought, Lord, are you done with us? You sent us into captivity. Okay, are you going to choose another nation to be your chosen people? He says, no, I'm going to have another generation. I think you're right that that's probably what they saw. The older generation seeing, hey, here's a group of young people that want to praise God. Here's our children that want to sing. Here's our, our next generation of people that want to take over the work from us. And it rejoiced them. They saw that God's promise was still going to be fulfilled. Okay, let's go on to the next one. Chapter 4. Somebody read the first two verses of chapter 4. Yeah. 
Yep. And that first verse was, when the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the people of the exile were building a temple to the Lord of God of Israel, they approached these people. What do, you, what do you see there? What's a lesson you can learn about when God tries to do something, what will happen? When God starts to do His work? Others will try to join it. Yeah. Yeah. And who was behind the others, ultimately? The devil, yeah. The devil will try to hinder the work of God, first, I believe, by infiltration. I don't think that the devil starts by persecution. Let me crush this work. No. He's too smart for that. He said, let me see if I can sneak in there and get somebody with a, a spy, maybe a spy mentality, go in there and try to bring division or bring some, let's do it this way, somebody with a bright idea because he's gifted and he speaks well and he's got all these ideas. He says, man, you know what? You know what, what your problem is? You need to be doing it this way. Look at that other church that I came from where I am so successful and it worked like this. Let's do it this way, infiltration. And it's the devil behind it. You know, there's a saying in the world, if you can't beat them, join them. <laughs> then you might be able to beat them. And the devil knows that. It's his idea. Join them. Infiltration. Any thoughts on that? How do, how do we recognize that? What's our... How do, we, how do we protect ourselves from that? How will we know whether, whether an idea that's come in, whether it, I might be the one through whom the devil is trying to bring that infiltration. Let's not point the finger at somebody else. Without knowing it, I might have this infiltration spirit. I might have the spirit of the world, the spirit of Babylon in me that I'm putting forth an idea and says, hey, I think we should do this, brothers. You know, let's say in our quarterly meeting, somebody comes up with an idea. If I don't have the Spirit of Christ, how do we protect ourselves? How do we know that the things we say are from God? That's a, that's a good, yeah, that's a very valuable lesson and a good point, Josh, that you're making that even though as a church, we, we, we want other ideas, we want all the, if, if the Lord, we want to be open to the fact that God may be leading somebody, but we recognize whom God has entrusted the responsibility for the decisions. He'll hold us accountable, Phil and I, for the decisions in this church. And so ultimately we have to take all these ideas in, pray about them, weigh them, and analyze and see, is this from the Lord or not? Or is this something else coming in? The devil's trying to sneak an infiltration mentality in there. And we take that seriously, yeah. Any other thoughts? I think it's also a close uh, study of the Word of God, looking to the Word yeah. for our example, for our pattern, for our decisions, uh, rather than to the methods of the world. Yeah. And I think we see that in the church today, where for church growth state, people look at the methods of the Word, yeah. A successful model, yeah. Uh, corporations that the church has followed that same pattern rather than looking at the Word of God for a pattern. Yeah. And I think it, it, it's the thing that uh, Israel was trapped with, you know, this infiltration. Yeah. Israel was doing really well, but in Numbers 23, we see that, you know, where Balak was so hmm. scared that Israel was coming at him that they were going to fight him, so he hired Balaam, you know, to hmm. give him all this curses. And Balaam couldn't curse him. Hmm know the story, yeah. but Balaam did a much more effective thing. He counseled Balak to say, hey, infiltrate them by marrying their together with them and getting partners mm. with them, maybe mm. in business and all these things. And, and so they did that. Mm. Said, hey, what's mine is yours. And mm. you see that? They said, come, let's be brothers and mm. let's all just live together. And, and they caused Israel to sin, mm. a grievous sin of many, yeah. many died in Israel. Yeah. Yeah, I like that you brought up that analogy because look at this the same if if the people of Israel at that time in Balaam and Balak's time had had the response that Zerubbabel had. Look at his response. You have nothing in common with us. I mean, they said, "Hey, we want to build a temple to your God. He's our God too." And they said, "No, we have nothing in common with us. We have nothing in common with the spirit of the world."
16 talking about how their mo- what their motives are. Hmm. They have motives that are other than. Hmm. And it's kind of like what you're saying. They, they have their own agenda. Yeah. Contrary to the teaching which you learned, yeah. Turn away from them. Hmm. Yeah, good point. Um, Jesus plus anything else. Friendship with the world, money, political connections or power in any way. Um, if we aspire to those things and have, we'll, we'll use those, that resource to build a church, God says no. Jesus plus anything else. That's how we, yeah, that, I like those two. The, the Word of God and, and uh, checking our own ambitions and our own motives. Okay, chap- uh, verses 4 and 5. If somebody can read chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. So we saw that, God, that the devil first tried to hinder the work of God by infiltration. Now what does he do? He said, that didn't work, so now I try to hinder the work of God by... Lobbyists. Lobbyists, yeah, there we go. Intimidation, there we go. That, okay, I did, infiltration didn't work because we've got people that are not interested. Now intimidate them, scare them, bring fear into them. I'll do this to you and I'll do that to you and I'll take away this privilege and I'll take away a 501c. <laughs> the day is coming, I think. You want tax write-off? Compromise. Don't preach on these things. Don't stand against that sin or we'll take away this privilege. You won't be able to meet in your own building. Day's coming, I believe with all my heart. And the Lord will test us to see, are we intimidated by the world, the spirit of the world? So the devil will try to hinder the work of God by intimidation if infiltration doesn't work. Verse 6, somebody read verse 6. So now it gets a little bit more. The devil tried infiltration, intimidation, and now what does he do? Accusation. He's going to actually, false accusation, and try to make that false accusation to somebody with power, the, the king or the president or whoever. Get them, write a letter that, uh, that will accuse these people of certain things. Twist the truth. And it wasn't complete falsehood. It was a twisting of the truth. And the devil will do that. I think the day will come as well when we will be accused of certain things. They will take certain things we say and certain things we do and twist it and make an accusation before the authorities in front of us and that will be the basis on which we will be brought forth before magistrates. See, that's how Jesus was brought forth. It was a false accusation. It was a twisting. He is inciting violence by calling himself the Son of God. And because of that, they crucified him. And if they did it to him, they'll do it to us. So, yeah. <laughs> yes, you're right. His tactics are pretty, pretty age-old, but we don't learn. That's the thing. He knows human beings still fall for those same tactics. I mean, today, the devil has infiltrated God's work, what started as God's work. And yet, like you said, thousands of years ago, we have this lesson. Today, the devil is intimidating people into saying certain things. Oh, we're not going to take a stand against homosexuality. We'll be very sort of gray on that area because we're intimidated. And then accusation. Okay, real quick, we'll finish the rest too, if you want, for your information. Verse uh, 5, verses 1 and 2, I'll read those quickly. Chapter 5. When the prophets, now all this is going on and they're intimidated and then something happens. When the prophets, Haggai the prophet, and we'll look at him in a few weeks, Zechariah the prophet, we'll look at him after that, the son of Edo, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of God of Israel who was over them. Then Zerubbabel, the, the, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, the son of Josedach, arose and began to rebuild the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. And the prophets of God were with them, supporting them. So when God sees this, this is the purpose of the spirit of prophecy. That's why Paul said, 
earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, but especially that you might prophesy. Do you know the reason we have a Bible study like this where all of you, we encourage to prophesy, not just say a cute idea that comes up to your head, but truly prophesy, because if you do prophesy, somebody sitting here may have gone through a week where the devil was trying to infiltrate their heart, trying to intimidate them, trying to accuse them before the throne of God, personally maybe, and the word of prophecy that God used through you, something small that you said, God used to encourage, exhort, console them to build up the church. So let's take that responsibility seriously, brothers and sisters, children, in our fellowship downstairs, in the times when we share and we use our words. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 3, this is prophecy, exhortation, uh, consolation, and encouragement. Encouragement, exhortation, consolation. To what? To encourage, to stir up the hands of a brother or sister who's going through a rough week saying, Go back to this week and rebuild the work of God. Don't worry about their intimidation and their accusation and their infiltration. Be encouraged. Stir up. Strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble, the book of Hebrews says. That's the gift of prophecy. Look at how the prophets came in. And now when we go back and go now and study the books of Haggai and Zechariah, think about this. This was their purpose. They came at a time when there was intimidation. Last one, verse 11 of chapter 5. And that's our memory verse for this week. Ezra 5 verse 11. And thus they answered us saying, let's read that together, can you? Uh, actually, no, we'll do it later because we probably have different translations. So we'll read it together when we put it up on, this, on the screen. But here's how it reads in my translation. Thus they answered us saying, we are the servants of the God of heaven and earth and are rebuilding the temple that was built many years ago, which, is a, which a great king of Israel built and finished. This phrase, we are the servants of the God of heaven and earth. Remember that. Dear brothers, dear sisters, your family of God, we are the servants of the God of heaven and earth. We're doing His work. Is there any intimidation? Is there any work of Satan that will succeed against God of heaven and earth? No. Let's have confidence. Let's be bold in our battles. Let's be encouraged. Let's be stirred up. Let's be strong in our battles, the battles we face this week, in our love for each other, in our unity, in our pursuit of righteousness. Let's be strong and encouraged. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that You'll use this study, Lord, and as we continue to meditate on, on these words that we've heard today, to, to be stirred up, to do your work wholeheartedly and not be slack, to give generously and to give of our money, to give of our time and our, our ambitions and our energies, 100% for you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's take a two or three minute break.